Welcome to another episode of 30 Minutes in the New Testament. 30 Minutes in the New Testament is a 1517 podcast network podcast. You can go to 1517.org slash podcast and check out all the other podcasts that are living over there and all the other things that are living over there, like videos, articles, academies, events, all that stuff. Uh, you can go and, and find all the things that we're doing. If you've only ever listened to the podcast, you're not, you're only, you're only tipping of the iceberg there. You got to get down to the base of that thing and see what else is going on. Also, if you're uh, wondering how all that stuff is existing over there, like what was happening here? How, like, I'm not paying for anything. I'm just over here learning and learning and getting the gospel for free. Well, that's because people like you make it possible by supporting the work, and you can go to that donate page. It's up there in the upper right-hand corner. Click on it, and you can become a reoccurring donor. You can give a one-time gift. You can do it any way that you want to do it, and uh, we would be happy to have you on board. Guys, we are in Matthew chapter 2. Uh, we saw, we kind of ended in a in an interesting spot. I think we kind of referenced this, but then we, we had to stop because time stops. It's in the... It's in the name of the show. We only go 30 minutes, and we stop wherever we are. Uh, Herod is going to kill some children. And one of the more like horrifying things, it's kind of interesting like that in the second chapter of the New Testament, you already have like this horrific event takes place, right? I mean, like as, as kind of horrific as a lot of things that happen in the Old Testament. You know, people say, oh, the Old Testament is so brutal. This is pretty brutal. Uh, Herod's going to lose his mind based on, and we talked about this, the wise men really not acting that wisely uh, when they, you know, seek him out and say, hey, we're looking for a king. You know where he is? Um, not the wisest of moves. And uh, this results, of course, in uh, the, this, what, we, what we call the slaughter of the innocents while Jesus is uh, hiding out in Egypt. So, uh, Eric, I think we could probably start in... Verse uh, verse 16. All right, will do. So yeah, we're in Matthew 2, verse 16. It says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, so you got to give him at least that, they did eventually come to their senses and realize, we're not going to have, we're not going to be above board entirely with Herod. Uh, so they that, did trick you him. God, you mean when God shows up and tells them <laughs> not to do that? <laughs> exactly. At least you got to give some credit. Dan doesn't uh, like says, you calling him wise. <laughs> Uh, it says, uh, of course, he became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Uh, incidentally, this is one of the reasons we say that the wise men visited the child Jesus uh, much later than, than when he was born, uh, because Herod had surmised that it had been sometime in the last couple of years. Uh, and so, so yes, this is the horrific scene. Now, probably important to note, you know, there was there a ton of children that were under two years old in the Bethlehem area and region? Pro probably not, uh, you know, a massive amount of children. But nevertheless, you know, one is too many. And Herod doesn't seem to have much value or care for uh, the citizens of Bethlehem, even though they are under his rule. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I, there's no, I don't know, I have any idea how many children this is, but um, I don't know. If you live in a small town, say, and this happens, I mean, this is going to, this is a horrific event, right? Absolutely. I mean, and, and just tells you, like, you, 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 you take, take someone, someone like Herod, and uh, so he's got all this power, and he's, you know, he's the king and all this stuff, but, like, also, like, how insecure is this guy? No, oh, yeah. yeah. You know? I mean, well, I mean, that's pretty typical for kings to be insecure about some sort of insurrection coming their way. In the history of kings, this is not a unique thing to do. Now, you know, sort of the miraculous nature of it is is very unique, but kings killing all possible rivals. I mean, there's there's stories like this in in England and all over. Europe. Right, Kill, I mean, killing your own family members, right? Like, yeah. I mean, if you got a younger brother, you know, and he's starting yeah. to you're starting to think, I better kill him before he kills me. Yeah. Which, incidentally, history tells us uh, Herod did that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, he was he was an evil dude, uh, and he had reason to be insecure because, of course, he was really just a a puppet king. I mean, he was installed there by Rome. He certainly was not. Uh, loved by the citizenry, he ruled with a with an iron fist. I mean, we know 
all that from what history tells us, not just about this Herod, but like basically all the Herodian dynasty. They were pretty, pretty nasty, pretty brutal people. Uh, so, so this is just right in line with the kind of, uh, with the way things were, were done oftentimes well, back then, unfortunately. And like you said, you just called it a dynasty. One of the ways you get a dynasty is to get rid of all, all other people that might usurp you. That's right. Yep. So it's gross, but it is a fact of history. It's a, again, one of these little details that when you read it, you go, this, this reads like history. Yeah. This, yeah. You, just... know, this, uh, there, you, you find this all over the gospels. When you read the gospels, it, it's, you know, one of the things that C.S. Lewis said when he had converted to Christianity was I've, I've read myths my whole life. I know what myth sounds like. I know what it reads like. This isn't that. This is meant, at least they are purporting to re, uh, give us actual historical events. It's also what yeah. God told them would happen to them if they had a king. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, he, it is. He, it is. It's again yeah. another fulfillment of what God warned them about yeah. uh, all those years ago. Yep. Yeah. So, but of course, Matthew being Matthew wants to show that basically every part of the Jesus story has its roots in the Old Testament. And so he says in verse 17, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. So in just for the second time in the last three verses or four verses, uh, Matthew once again is quoting from the Old Testament to again show the Jewish audience that he is writing to that Jesus is indeed their Messiah. If Matthew doesn't tell you that this is about that, I don't know if you're going to make this connection, right? Um, you, know, you got like a, a name, you know, you have Rachel. Of course, you know, Rachel is, he's, he's speaking there of the, the sort of the mother of Israel and this kind of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, this is, so Matthew's doing this work for you where he's like, hey, if you're wondering, this is uh, about this ultimately. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, one of the things that's, that you, that you, it's hard to miss this, but you're, you're sort of, if you're wondering, and maybe, maybe martyrdom is not the right word, but, uh, because I mean, these, these children didn't have a, a choice in the matter, obviously. Um, they were, it wasn't as if they were dying for their confession of faith or whatever, but they certainly were dying, uh, because of the entrance of Christ into, you know, into the world. Uh, and this is like sort of the, the first, if you're wondering how the world is going to respond to God showing up, you get your answer kind of right away. Uh -huh. This is how they're going to respond. Yeah. They have, did the world has a deicide on its mind from the beginning. Yes. Man. Yes. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. I mean, it is true, uh, unfortunately. And, and again, you will see this sort of repeat itself. And I'm reminded of, um, even though this isn't in this gospel, you know, Simeon's prophecy uh, to uh, Mary about Jesus and that there's going to be this sort of sword that will cause division. And right, at, right out of the gate, even from his birth, you see the dividing line. Yeah. It's very clear. So verse 19, it says, But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. Dude, if you're if you're like this, they'd be like, "I'm gonna go save the world." This is you're off to like a terrible start, <laughs> right? Uh, that, that that that's exactly the way that God does it. Where you're, you're, I mean, if you're reading the story, you're like, "Wait, this is the guy." I like mm -hmm. he's like this is not going well uh, at all uh, yeah. from the jump. Yeah, this is, but this, as you pointed out, Scott, this is the way God seems to love working all throughout history. On the um, edges. Yep, and 1 Corinthians 1 is a great example of that where mm -hmm. Paul talks about the, the foolish things being the ones that, that actually end up being wise through the power of God. Uh, you know, you go on down the line. This, is the, this fits the entire narrative of all the Bible. 
where oftentimes the firstborn is not the chosen one, but in fact it's the younger child. You know, this is all. Well, this is the well, way God works. Well, maybe, maybe what what Jesus needs is like a really uh, respectable person in a position of power <laughs> and influence to maybe like introduce him to the world. Maybe like maybe he could have someone prepare the way that you know can can get him into the the halls of power and 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 you know introduce him to the right people. Maybe that's what's going to happen in uh, in chapter three. He'll, he'll get you're introduced to one of those guys. Well, Dan, uh, that that is certainly not the case because oh. the guy who's preparing the way for Jesus is a weirdo. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Case in point, chapter three, Matthew verse one. Yeah, in those days, down. John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Uh, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay, yeah, this is not the guy that you would have picked uh, to to say, all right, I need someone to to announce that I'm here. I need somebody to... to I need somebody really them... respectable. Yeah. Uh, let's put him in the center of town so we can have the most impact with the most people, maybe near the temple to imply yeah. that this is a holy thing that's happening. If we can get him in the temple, that'd be great. Yeah, if he, um, maybe maybe he could thing. be a priest or like a... Yeah. Uh, like a, a scrap some cell. nice duds, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of like what I tell our uh, our development people. You go meet with somebody that's you know kind of uh, get some nice studs. Look the part, you know. Yeah. Come on, yeah. look the part. And, that's right. Uh, no, not not you know. John. John's John. John took it. He's like, listen, my dad was a priest. Me, not so much. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be out in the wilderness dressed yeah. like Elijah. How about that? And you're like, that's. I mean, that's a little. That's one way to do okay. it. Yeah. Uh, and but but here's the the surprising thing it it is because again God is working through the lowly things and the unexpected things it's successful I mean it's it's kind of hard for us to picture because he's it's very purposeful that uh, he is out in the wilderness yep the wilderness the place of devastation the place of desolation you know it was th that word was literally associated with that that idea that it was a place that you went to to uh, you know sort of endure trouble and difficulty and challenge. Uh, and yet people are coming out to him in, in, in droves. Yeah. And they are indeed repenting and confessing their sins and being baptized uh, to prepare themselves for the arrival of the Messiah. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things that, uh, that you got to take apart in, in this portion. of So you have in those days, John the Baptist came preaching the wilderness. So we talked about the wilderness of Judea. Uh, what is his message? This message is very simple. Like, so, I mean, so you might, might think like, well, if you're going to be out in the wilderness looking like a maniac, uh, you must be, have like a com very compelling thing going on. Uh, like, like, what is what is the language that he's that he's using that's making all? Is he some great orator? Is that what's happening? His message is this: repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, if you want to know about the efficacy of the word. Uh, this is a good argument for it because normally, if you just had like some guy out in the out in the wilderness yelling "repent," people aren't going out there for that. Like, that's, well, dude, you, normally, you know. if you just have some guy doing that outside of a football game, yeah, nobody's people aren't listening. going out there for that, that's which what, we that's see today all the time. I'll take well, your word is, for it. Well, this is a thing when you see guys out on now. Listen, I'm not trying to diminish street preaching or something, but let me do it a little bit. And, and tell you <laughs> that if I'm not you trying read, to do the thing I'm about to do. Yeah, like I'm just not trying. Don't take it personally, guys. But if this is you, uh, just because you read in the scriptures that John went out there, it was yelling for people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, doesn't mean that if you go do the same thing that that, that that's going right. to work. Like you are not the chosen one, my friend. Right. You are not the greatest person born of woman or anything like this. You are not the the forerunner. This is what I mean is that like John has got like the like the Holy Spirit is like working through these words in like a like a real powerful way or this doesn't work. Yeah. Right. That's right. That's right.
And and there and, and yet we know, you know, in the early church there are others, uh, you know, even in the New Testament that are called to go out and use by the Holy Spirit in a completely different way. And they're called to argue for the faith, to make the make the case, um, and the Holy Spirit uses that too. It's just in so, John's case, he had one job, one very simple message. He delivered it. God worked. And, yeah. So, so what do you what do you do with this? Uh, this is always because you're going to hear this language a lot. So I think we should talk about it. Um, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, so this is something that like a, a Christian would know this kind of language, and maybe they don't think about it much. But uh, what what does that what does that mean? What does That's he mean? Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's Jesus. I mean. Any time that Jesus Himself is referring to the kingdom of heaven as and He's speaking of Himself. Like the so king, when, like the king is there, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, that He is the kingdom of heaven. That that even when you enter into the kingdom of heaven, what are you expecting? You should be expecting to enter into the presence of Jesus because that's what it is. Yep. This is what's being prepared by John. This is what's being fulfilled by Christ. This is what you'll enter when you enter glory. Um, whether you're raised from the dead and you enter it with him or whether you're still alive when he comes again, when you enter glory, you will be entering the presence of Christ. Yeah. And that, so the kingdom of heaven, when you hear that in the scriptures, when you hear that in the new Testament, just think of your mind in your mind, Jesus, especially, and you guys do this a lot when you're trying to figure out what a parable means. And yep. Jesus mm-hmm. says the kingdom of heaven is like, and that he's going to start describing himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, After he's gonna that. he's gonna start telling you that how he works, right? So like yeah. when Jesus, I was gonna that's exactly where I was gonna go, Scott. So you're gonna start hearing this language out of the mouth of Jesus when he's telling stories and telling parables, and he's gonna say the kingdom of heaven may be compared to the kingdom of heaven is like. What does he mean? He means this is the way I work. That's right. right. So this is how and like in the way that the way that I do things is like this, right? And that's what he means. He doesn't mean uh, something. Un, like un, un, uh, unattached from himself, he's like, I. This is how I operate. Uh, here's a story. Here's an illustration of how it's going to work, right? Uh, and usually has to do with salvation, right? How this is yeah. this is the way that I'm going to save. You're not going to believe it. It's going to be like unlike anything that you could have ever thought. And I'll tell mm-hmm. you a story, and you're still going to be confused at the end of the story. But uh, here's a story to tell you how that is. And and of course. You know, he, he says this to fulfill what the prophet Isaiah was saying, the voice of one cried, cried in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. This is, of course, I think, uh, the paths were not real straight. Uh, like, so if you're trying to figure out, like, the way of the Lord, uh, John seems to think, and of course, Isaiah is prophesying, that this path is uh, gotten very windy. Right. right. Uh, so the like the the teachers of the law, the Pharisees. This is not like a straight shot, you know. Like so, if I if Scott mm-hmm. says, "Hey, Dan, I'm I'm visiting you over there, and, you know, where you live. I'm tr- I'm here. I'm trying to get to this awesome world class bike trail over here. Like, how would I do that? Uh, uh, he would like me to give him the straightest shot uh, to get from one place to the other. Uh, but it'd be like if I said, well. Here's the windiest path possible, like with all the traffic and like and the and the construction. That just happened to me. Yeah, <laughs> I, we went to go stay. I was uh, driving our friend Kurt somewhere, and we went to go stay um, somewhere. And I was going to get up and go on the run the next morning. And I asked the guy who we were staying with, like, "How do I get to the running trail?" And he goes, "Okay, you're going to go out the front door. You're going to make a right. Then you're going to make a left. After about two point two miles, you're going to make a right. You can take your next immediate left, and then another <laughs> left, and then a right, and then a left, and you should see it on your left hand side." And I'm like. I, you know, there's no possible way I'm no making it to my I'm destination. Going to find that running trail, so I'm just going to go run wherever I run in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so the, the so the plea here is what is to say, and what does this mean? Like, hey, the the directions you're going to give from like where the sinner is to where the Lord is, you better straighten that road out because uh, it, like it's this thing has been you have you have uh, and Jesus is going to make a lot of. Uh, hey, about this is like you have made this road way more complicated than it is, and John. That's exactly is, right. Yeah, John I mean, is out here know, just he, saying, "Confess your sins." That's the road. What one of the things that uh, Jesus, you know, really goes after the Pharisees for, uh, and we will see that uh, in extended detail quite a bit later on in Matthew's gospel, is they keep on putting stumbling blocks in the way of people to get to the Lord. Yeah, and the stumbling blocks, is, the stumbling block is constantly adding things and burdens to people's plates that they need to do. 
This is why yep. Jesus calls them brood of vipers and that's right. things all the time. Not, yes. not because they're actually, you know, any broodier or viperier than the rest of us. It's just that they sort of are supporting this system that is uh, meant to really focus on you doing this really complicated set of right things in order to, you know, find the path of the Lord yeah. rather than just placarding Christ. That's right. Yeah. And and so John is going to uh, be a, a, a for, he's going to foreshadow this for us right now because it says in verse seven, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, well, he didn't have uh, quite the same message for them. He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Mm -hmm. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, I guess John does know how to preach if he needs to. I mean, because, man, well, that, is, uh, that is both barrels of the law. Yeah, well, if you tell a bunch of uh, Jews from this time, you know, who pride themselves on being the descendants of Abraham and that consider themselves special um, because of that, that they're not special and that God mm -hmm. could make a bunch of rocks um, to be, to take the place that they've taken if he wanted to, you know, you're just saying you're no more special than that rock over here. And God could have worked through that rock to bring about the Messiah. He chose yeah. to work through you. Um, but this was not of your doing. This was of his doing. This was not because you were special. This is because of this was his plan. Um, to bring about the Christ, a oh boy. And there's that's there's something offense, really interesting thing. too about him choosing to use the word stones here, because in rabbinic literature around that time, Gentiles were referred to as mm -hmm. nothing more valuable than a rock. Right. And so there there is this sort of double meaning here. They're not just hearing that like literally a rock could be used by God, but also those Gentiles, Gentiles. who you despise and hate with a holy passion because of their debauchery and their sinfulness, well, not only can God make them into children of Abraham, he's going to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, and there's a whole thing that's going on here. You have to like paint this whole picture where, so John is out there looking like Elijah, by the way, we didn't talk to him about that, but like, that's what the, that's what the, you know, the leather belt and the, you know, the, the camel hair and the locust and the honey. That's what this is all about. And you're like, this is all about, Yo, is that Elijah come back? What's going on out there? Does, it, does this guy cosplaying Elijah out in the wilderness? I was just going to say he's <laughs> cosplaying. <laughs> like, what's happening here? And he's and he's out there talking about the kingdom of heaven as a hand. He's fulfilling some prophecy about making the paths straight. Well, who had made the paths not straight? Who had put like all the speed bumps and hurdles and and twists and turns in this? Uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees are some of the main culprits of this. They're coming out to say, like, what's going on here? Is this guy baptizing Jews? I mean, like, are Jews out here confessing that they're sinners and getting baptized, like a bunch of Gentiles or something? Like, what, what's happening here? Do you have to picture like the religious leaders showing up and just observing, right? Like they're not they're not there to confess any sins. They're not there to do any to get baptized or anything like that. They're there to observe. And John addresses them as the ones who had corrupted these paths and complicated the way to God and said, what? Like, hey, no one's warning you to flee from the wrath to come. I, I, I'm not talking to you guys, you know, a bunch of unrepentant religious leaders up there, you brood of vipers. And then he says this, and you, this is a thing that you get here tossed around a lot, uh, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And people will say this all the time, right? Where they'll be like, well, you know, there's you got to repent, but also you got to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Completely re remove this text from its context. What What is John saying with the, to them, like bear fruit in keeping with repentance? They're not down there confessing any sins. They're not repenting. What What is he saying to them? Well, their presence there, observing, but not participating, is telling John that these men don't think they have anything to repent for, right? So like they're not there to confess sins. They're not there to be baptized. They're there to stand in judgment. Uh, and he is saying like, hey, here's the thing is you actually don't bear the fruit of repentance. So you do have sins to confess. Like you're, 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 this whole thing's a lie that you're doing right now. Like you should be down here in the water with the rest of these sinners, but you think that you don't have any, sin and 
this is a, a, a strange thing, but believing that you don't have sin to confess, that means you're not having any fruit of repentance. Because one of the fruits of repentance, maybe the primary fruit of repentance, is that you would continue to confess your sin, right? Yeah. That would that would be the repentant life. And these guys aren't going to do that. Right. right. Yeah, that's right. And and John continues. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting. There's a separation in the paragraph in the ESV translation here. But he's still addressing the same audience. He's addressing the Pharisees and Sadducees. And that's important to keep in mind because he says here, quote, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, I'm going to make the case here that John is still preaching the law to them. And he's saying, the one that is coming after me is going to judge you. So, Dude, you know, this sometimes is, this we... Is the great, this is the great choice. John is saying, like, you can get down here in this water and confess your sins. <laughs> that's and exactly get that what he's saying. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, another thing. You don't want the baptism of fire, guys. Like, that's not... You don't want the Sodom and Gomorrah <laughs> baptism. That's not the baptism you want. But John right. is saying that's the baptism. <laughs> these are your options. You want to know what the options are? Well, water baptism for the forgiveness of sins, or a guy that's coming after me, and you don't want yeah. his baptism. His baptism is a totally different thing. Yeah, this is all judgment language, and I think it's just important to note... You know, when I was coming up, Dan, uh, youth group, uh, at the youth group I went to, every once in a while they would sing a song or two, you know, that talked about being on fire for Jesus. And then you look at the context of, like, how often Mm -hmm. fire is used in the New Testament and the Old Testament, and you're like, I don't know if I really want to be on fire. That uh, that usually equates with judgment. Dude, there's, like, one time where some, like, little tongues of fire appear over some guy's heads, and and now ever since then everyone said, like, we want the fire. Meanwhile, there's a And by the way, those of tongues of fire were also a sign of judgment. Well, I just, I mean, every other reference in the Bible where the fire of the Lord comes, it's, I mean, our God is a consuming fire. That's not, you don't want that. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's not, not talking not... about like, therefore you should be passionate. That's talking no. about like, therefore you should fear, O oh man, fear, yes. O oh sinner. Yes, and even this, like, what well, is this? It baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, and you're like, even those, like, well, which one would you like? Like, <laughs> like I, like, I think the one you want is the the Holy Spirit baptism, that water baptism for the forgiveness of sins, where you also get the reception of the Holy Spirit, or you can get this other baptism, which is going to be like that that consuming fire of God baptism, and that's, you're going to want to avoid that one. And yeah, John is telling the, the religious leaders for sure, um, you know it would be a good idea, is if you got down here before that other guy gets over here. But that other guy is about to make his entrance onto the scene, uh, and uh, he's definitely going to go to war with the religious leaders. It's going to be his, his primary adversary. Uh, but we're going to have to wait, because we have gone long already, so we're going to have to oh, wait yeah. until next episode. Uh, to talk about that, but I'll see you guys then. All right, sounds good.